بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد الصادق الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقال الله جل وعلا في كتابه الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وكذلك يجتبيك ربك ويعلمك من تأويل الأحاديث ويتم نعمته عليك وعلى آل يعقوب كما أتمها على أبويك من قبل إبراهيم وإسحاق إن ربك عليم حكيم صلق الله العظيم Alhamdulillah, the past couple of weeks we've been talking about this verse that really opens into the story after Yusuf alayhi salam related his dream to his father Ya'qub alayhi salam. We're still in the very beginning part of the story, right before the brothers hatch their plot and express their jealousy. And in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and in this manner, or, and this is how, i.e. through the dream, your Lord has chosen you and has taught you the interpretation of dreams so that he may complete his favor upon you and upon the family of Ya'qub, just as he completed his favor upon the two fathers before you, your two fathers before you, Ibrahim and Ishaq. Verily, your Lord is all-knowing, all-wise. Last week we talked about the lessons we learned from Ya'qub telling Yusuf alayhi salam to keep the dream a secret and not disclose it to his brothers. We talked about envy and sibling rivalry and we looked at some of the different blessings and favors Allah Ta'ala gave Yusuf. We spoke about the meaning of the term ijtiba as being chosen and selected. And we talked about whether that is speaking about prophethood or other blessings. We said that it has to refer to one or the other. It cannot refer to both. Because later in the verse, it mentions the completion of favor. And that is referring either to prophethood or to something else. So we said that this ijtiba can refer to being selected and chosen for nubuwa, or it could be being selected and chosen for other favors. And these other favors would be authority, would be handsomeness, would be other blessings Allah Ta'ala gave him. And then we looked at the meaning of ta'wil al-ahadith, because this is Ya'qub alayhi salam speaking to his son Yusuf, saying, in this manner, through this dream, Allah has selected you. Allah has selected you and is teaching you and shall teach you ta'wil al-ahadith. We mentioned that the ulama of tafsir say that the ta'wil al-ahadith refers to the interpretation of dreams. However, the term ahadith can refer to more than just dreams. Uh, the word for dreams is ahlam, ta'wil al-ahlam. Here, one could suggest that it's not just dreams, but also the interpretation of speech, of discourse, of being gifted with the knowledge of discerning when a person is telling the truth or speaking a lie, of knowing how things will unfold based on what is disclosed in conversation. Uh, some of the ulama, such as Ibn Ajiba, say that ta'wil al-ahadith is the interpretation of dreams as well as having a deep understanding of the ahadith, meaning the, the narratives of the previous anbiya and the ulum, the sciences of the anbiya before him. So this is broader than just dream interpretation. And then we looked at the part in the ayah where Allah Ta'ala says, 
and this is Ya'qub speaking to Yusuf, وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ And he completes his favor, his blessing upon you, and upon the family of Ya'qub. And we were looking at this last week. What is the meaning of the completion of favor? Is it prophethood? Or is it something else? Other favors. A lot of the ulama of tafsir look at the first phrase, ijtiba, and say it is speaking about power, authority, uh, and handsomeness, and other favors that he was selected for by Allah Ta'ala. And they say that this part, this completion of favor upon you and the family of Ya'qub, refers to nubuwa refers to prophethood, that Allah Ta'ala will select Yusuf Alayhi salam with Nubuwa being a prophet of Allah Ta'ala. When we look at this part of the verse, we see the wow, the and. وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوب He completes the favor upon you and upon the family of Ya'qub. If we say that the completion of favor here is referring to nubuwa, to prophethood, would it also mean that it's saying the family of Ya'qub are also blessed with prophethood? Or could we say that the and here is referring to a different ni'mah altogether, other than prophethood? The ulama differ about this. Some of the ulama of tafsir take the position that this part, of, this part of the verse, the completion of favor, is about prophethood. That Allah Ta'ala shall bestow nubuwa upon Yusuf alayhi salam and the family of Ya'qub refers to the brothers and they too will inherit the rank of nubuwa. This is a position of some, not the majority, but it's a position. The other position says, no, this is speaking about Yusuf alayhi salam, and the favor received by the family of Ya'qub is different from prophethood. It's not prophethood itself, it's other favors. So we want to talk about this because this is going to show up in the story, and it also shows up or in impacts our understanding of other verses of the Qur'an that speak about the asbat, the uh, the asbat are referred to as a group of prophets that hail from Ya'qub. And some say that the asbat are referring to the 12, the, the 12 tribes of Bani Israel. At the head of them are, uh, each of them being a head from the family of Ya'qub, one of the brothers. So were the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam later given the rank of Nubuwa? prophethood or were they not which ulama held that position what's their proof why did they take that position who rejected that position and what was their reasoning for rejecting it but before we can look into the details about that we have to look at prophethood itself when we say that Yusuf alayhi salam was tasked with nubuwa it was given this divine favor we have to understand what is nubuwa and what are the qualities a nabi must have. Nubuwa is receiving revelation from Allah Ta'ala and having carrying the burden of leading a people. Usually the nabi is coming with a law, a sharia from a previous prophet and is usually conveying that sharia with or without a scripture from a previous prophet. This Nabi, any Nabi, has to have certain qualities. Certain qualities are required for a prophet to be a prophet. One of them is amana. There, have to, there has to be trustworthiness. Amana, in this context, means they have divine protection. They have divine protection from sins. And we call that usma in Arabic. It's a term we use in our tradition, in Aqidah. 
It is the divine protection Allah gives to the Anbiya where they are infallible and protected from sins because a prophet has to be obeyed. When a prophet comes to his nation, whatever he says and does is to be followed. If they were not protected from sins, then it would be obedience to copy them in doing something that is disobedience, which makes disobedience obedience. So prophets are infallible, they're protected from sin, and according to Ahl Sunnah, all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are ma'asum. They are protected from error, and this much is agreed upon by all of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah. It's the unanimous position of Ahl Sunnah. But when we get into the details, we find there's different views. Uh, so when we look at the differences, we see that there's a difference about the scope of Isma. In other words, when we say that a prophet is ma'asum, protected from sin, does that mean they're protected from sin before they're given nubuwa as well as after? Or does it mean they're only given usma when Allah tasks them with nubuwa? Which would mean a prophet is ma'asum when they are given the rank of nubuwa, but before they were given that rank, they weren't ma'asum. That, that is a position. That is a position among some of the ulama. Furthermore, we have to look at the scope of isma and what it refers to. What are they protected from exactly? When we say that the anbiya are protected from sin, what kind of sins are we talking about here? Do, are we talking about only major sins? Or are we also talking about minor sins? And there are some disagreements about this among the ulama. But the majority position of ulama in aqidah, the overwhelming majority position is that the anbiya as a whole are ma'asum. They are protected from sin and error before their nubuwa and after their nubuwa. And they are protected from sin, both major and minor. Some of the ulama in the past said that these prophets are protected from major sins and minor sins that are sins that have some, we call it khissa. You know, they're very loathsome. And they say examples of that would be stealing a morsel of food or uh, slightly cheating in a scale. But if it was something that was non-loathsome, such as looking at an attractive woman, they would say that that's a minor sin that's not of khissa, but that's not negated from a prophet before prophethood. But the majority position, yani, مَسْتَقَرَّ عَلَيْهِ أَهْلِ سُنَّةِ عُمُومًا As they say, the mostly settled position of Ahl Sunnah historically is that the Anbiya as a whole are protected from sins, major and minor, before Nubuwa and after. That's the majority position. And having ad adopted that majority position and under understood it, it informs how we understand the tafsir of Qur'an. Because if we take that position as our lens, when we look into the story, we are asking ourselves, this completion of favor upon the family of Yaqub, the brothers, and the family as a whole, can we say that's nubuwa? Can we say that it refers to prophethood? Because that would mean the brothers of Yusuf السلام, would also later on be gifted by Allah Ta'ala, the station of Nubuwa. But how can we affirm that if we have established that they have committed not just one sin, but several sins? And not just ordinary minor sins that people commonly fall into, but actually several major sins. So we look at the sins. What were the sins? Number one is hasad, there's envy. 
Number two, there is disrespect, uquq, mistreatment of their father. Number three, qat'ur rahim, is cutting the family ties with Yusuf. Number three is plotting against him. Number four or five is lying by falsifying his, the reason for his disappearance. And further on in the story, they say that, oh, he, if, if his brother Binyamin has stolen, well, he, Binyamin has a brother who stole before as well. This is slander. So there's many major sins like this. There is no prophet who committed these kinds of things before they were given the, the maqam of nubuwa. So the conclusion, according to this position, is that they couldn't have been prophets even after this. And that informs our understanding. Now, if someone is taking a, another position, if they're saying, no, it's possible that uh, they could be prophets because Isma only applies to when they receive Nubuwa, well, they may find some supporting evidence in the context to say, yes, they were later gifted Nubuwa. And that's the position of some ulama in history, but it's not the majority. So just we want to look at this a little bit. Now, those who affirmed the prophethood for the brothers, their main proof is not anything in the story in Surah Yusuf at all. They only have some indications within the story, ihtimalat, possibilities within the story that would point to that. The most direct proof they have for affirming nubuwa for the brothers are the verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us to say we believe in Allah and what he has revealed to us and what he has revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub wal asbat the mentioning of the asbat because here one prophet is mentioned after another and with the tafsir that the asbat refer to the brothers of or the sons of Yaqub that would indicate that they are prophets and this position is taken by some of the early scholars of tafsir uh, Sa'id bin Jubair in particular Abu Alia uh, Qatada, Suddi, a, a few among the early Mufassirs understood that verse to refer to the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. And they said that these wrong actions they committed were before Nubuwa. Therefore, it doesn't contradict the Usma they would have as they were blessed with Nubuwa, as with prophethood. That's a position. And you know we're honest about the positions that exist in our tradition. Even if we don't agree with them, they exist. The majority view, however, is that they were not prophets before or after this event. Imam Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir, and he's the author of a very famous tafsir, most of us have heard of it. Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir of this verse, he says, there's no proof establishing the prophet uh, establishing prophethood for Yusuf's brothers he says some claim that they received revelation after these events but that is questionable fihi nazar he says and the claimant needs to furnish proof whereas he only mentions the verse about the asbat to which it is replied, that is only a possibility. That's only an ihtimal. And that's because the asbat of Bani Israel referred to the sub-tribes. And Allah Ta'ala mentions the asbat in general because there were so many, each of which descended from the brothers of Yusuf. And there is no proof that they, the brothers of Yusuf, received wahi. So the word used in the verse asbat is uh, the plural of sibt and sibt in its original meaning in Arabic refers to a tree that has lots of branches that's the original meaning in Arabic and it is later applied to uh, anyone who has many 
uh, sons with grandsons and many descendants. If we say that this applies to the brothers of Yusuf directly, well, we have to wrestle with the issue of Isma and what they did. And those who say that the Asbath referred to the brothers of Yusuf, the response of Ibn Kathir is that Asbat can refer to the sub-tribes, and it's not just the sons of one father. It can refer to grandchildren as well. For instance, Rasulullah said about his grandson, Sayyidina Hussein, he said, Sibtul min al-Asbat. Hussein is a special grandson among the grandchildren. So Sibt can mean a grandchild, not just the immediate son of someone. Therefore, those who negate prophethood from the brothers say that the Asbat refer not to the sons of Yaqub, but rather to the descendants of those, so, those sons and the sub-tribes of Bani Israel. They were prophets. It doesn't mean that their fathers were necessarily prophets. And that's the general response. There's nothing explicit in that verse, uh, nor is there anything explicit in any hadith which says that the brothers of Yusuf السلام, were anbiya later on. Uh, some have said that the proof that they were anbiya is the fact that they were seen as stars in the dream. Uh, Imam uh, Al Alusi, he mentions in his tafsir, he, he takes the position that they were not prophets. And he says, some people have said that when Yusuf السلام, saw his brothers in the form of stars, that's an indication that they would later become prophets. Because what? Because why? Because stars provide guidance at night. But Imam al Lusi he negates this. He says, number one, that's a possibility. That, that's an ihtimal. It might be, it might not be. That's not strong enough. And number two, if them being stars is an indication that they would later become prophets, what about the moon in the dream? The moon is his mother. And no one says that she was a prophet. No one takes that position. So if she's not a prophet because of the meaning of that dream, then min babi awla, even more so, would we negate them being prophets just based on them being stars in the dream. So the conclusion of the majority is that they were not prophets because of so many of those major sins they committed. But we know from the story that Allah Ta'ala forgave them, that Allah Ta'ala uh, turned to them in tawbah. And they were stars at the end, weren't they? Because they did provide guidance for people in the future in showing them how to make things right after they've wronged people and how to heal after family trauma how to come together after relationships have been damaged through wrong actions. And in that sense, the favor Allah Ta'ala bestowed upon Yusuf was Nubuwa, and the favor he bestowed upon the family of Yaqub, if we say it refers to the brothers, it's that healing, that rectification, that salvation, and the safety that comes from that. And this is all based on our understanding that the prophets are protected from sins before prophethood and after prophethood and that the protection applies to major sins as well as minor sins. Now in the verse after Yaqub talks about this, he says, Allah shall teach you the interpretation of dreams and complete his blessing favor upon you and upon the family of Yaqub as he completed the favor upon your fathers, Ibrahim and Ishaq. We want to look at this part. As he completed the favor upon your fathers before you, Ibrahim and Ishaq. Note how Yaqub refers to the grandfathers as your fathers, showing the affinity, the closeness they had. And how was the favor completed for them? How was the favor, the blessing completed for Ibrahim and Ishaq? The ulama mention a number of things. They say, number one, Ibrahim alayhi salam was chosen with the rank of Khullah because he is Khalilullah, 
the Khalil of Allah means the intimate friend. He was chose with, chosen with that station of Khulla. He was also chosen with Risala. He was also delivered from the fire. He was also delivered from Nimrod. He was also given victory. So, and he was also uh, victorious in so many fronts. So he was chosen in so many different ways. And, Is- and Ishaq was chosen with Nubuwa. We, and according to one position, safety from the from slaughter. Now, this opens up another area of investigation we don't want to go into. When the ulama of tafsir mentioned this, what they're alluding to is an early disagreement among scholars about the identity of the one who was sacrificed or to be sacrificed by Ibrahim alayhi salam. We say that the Dhabih, the one who was supposed to be sacrificed by divine command, who was then replaced by the sacrificing of the ram, was Ismail alayhi salam. That is the overwhelming majority view of ulama. However, there is a very strong argument to be made and a position held by many scholars in the past that it was actually Ishaq. And this is not the time to go into the argument. Um, the argument in favor of it being Ishaq, in, to me at least, is not, I don't find it convincing. But it was there, you know, and there's something to be said for it. And according to that position, the ulama of tafsir say that the safety from that would also be a part of the favor, the blessing given to Ishaq. Uh, in any case, Nubuwa itself is a tremendous favor, and that was given to Ishaq alayhi salam. And then uh, Yaqub, who's speaking here to his son Yusuf, he then says, Verily, your Lord is Alimun Hakim. He mentions two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we learn in tafsir that as we read the Qur'an and engage with its meanings, we always pay attention to the names of Allah that are mentioned at the end of verses like this. Because there's always a connection between the names of Allah mentioned at the end of these verses and what is mentioned in the verse itself. Therefore, what is the connection between the divine name Al-Arim, the All-Knowing, and the name Al-Hakim? How do they relate to what Yaqub is saying to his son Yusuf in this situation? Imam al-Razi says that Al-Alim, by mentioning the divine name Al-Alim, the All-Knowing, Yaqub mentions this name because it points to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses for Nubuwa whomever he wills. And his knowledge is without beginning, without end, without limitation. And he chooses for his for Nubuwa whomever he wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Allah knows best where to place his message. He placed it with Yusuf and did not place it with others. Allahu alim. Allah is all knowing. He knows best where to place it. And the second one, Hakim, the wise. He says, Imam al Razi says that the mentioning of Al Hakim in this context is because Allah Ta'ala is uh, exalted, munazzah, transcendent, uh, beyond foolishness, beyond ignorance, and beyond doing things in a haphazard or foolish manner. He only places Nubuwa in luminous and pure souls. So the two are interconnected. All-knowing and wise with reference to who is given the gift of Nubuwa, and that is Yusuf alayhi salam. And this is really the, 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 the starting point of the story before it shifts into the response of the brothers. We have Yusuf alayhi salam, the, the opening of the chapter, and then Yusuf alayhi salam saying to his father, I saw, I saw 11 stars and the sun and the moon. I saw them all prostrating to me. And then comes the response of his father. And then the glad tidings. 
and then the end of this verse. And then we shift into Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala does the shifting by, says, by saying that in this story are signs for those who ask. And then he mentions immediately the plot and the response of the brothers. So we have here already a shift very quickly in the story. And this is what we call iltifat. We go from Yusuf salam speaking about the dream, his father responding, Allah Ta'ala mentioning that in this are signs, and then the brothers, now they're talking. Between seeing the dream and the actual conversation of the brothers is an undetermined amount of time. It's, it didn't happen a minute later. We, it's an undetermined amount of time, but we understand that some time elapsed between the conversation of Yaqub and Yusuf and the brothers talking among themselves. So there is this shift here. And, and this is really the first segment of the story. Now, this actually opens the door for us to reflect on the first part of the story, the opening of the story, if you will. And in that reflection, we want to look at something that we touched on a little bit in the beginning but didn't go into great detail about. Uh, in the first part of the tafsir class, we looked at the science of Qur'an in general, and we looked a little bit into the science of tafsir, how tafsir operates as a science. We talked a little bit about the ways uh, a scholar of tafsir engages in tafsir. And we mentioned there's tafsir of the Qur'an by the Qur'an itself, Tafsir of the Qur'an by hadith, by the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, and tafsir by the statements of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and so on. But that is only one type of tafsir. Let's look at a couple of the different types, and in particular, a type that gives us a window into some reflections about the first part of the story. When we look in the books of tafsir, and there are many, we see that they each have a certain theme about them. There's different genres of tafsir. And the first genre of tafsir, and the, and the most famous genre, is what we call uh, a tafsir bil ma'thur. A tafsir bil ma'thur literally means tafsir by way of transmission by way of what is transmitted in the athar, the report. And that is the tafsir of Qur'an by Qur'an. The tafsir of Qur'an by prophetic statements and hadith. Tafsir of Qur'an by the statements of the Sahaba and the statements of the Tabi'een or a very broad tafsir based on the outwardly apparent, obvious meaning of a verse. And this is our foundation in tafsir. Tafsir bil ma'thur. The most famous tafsir bil ma'thur that we have is perhaps the tafsir of Imam al-Tabari because it's one of the earliest and it catalogs what has been said and recorded about the meanings of the verses. Uh, other famous examples of tafsir bil ma'thur is the tafsir of Ibn Kathir. That's a very famous tafsir. It's translated into English, I think also in Urdu and other Islamic languages. It's very famous and it's very straightforward as well. You read the passage in the Quran, Imam Ibn Kathir cites hadith after hadith from various collections about the meanings of those verses, the statements of the Sahaba, if there are any, statements of Tabi'een, and he'll at offer his own position after mentioning all of those things. But it's a very famous example of standard tafsir bil ma'thur, transmitted tafsir. Um, the f probably the most exhaustive example is uh, Adur al ma'thur fil tafsir bil ma'thur of Imam al Suyuti. He kind of cataloged everything that had been said in this area of tafsir. The in, in, kind of standing at the opposite or 
on the other side of this kind of tafsir is what we call a tafsir bir ra'i tafsir bir ra'i literally means tafsir with opinion and we don't mean an unfounded opinion but it is possible that there exists a tafsir bir ra'i in that it's an unfounded opinion and that would be condemned but generally the tafsir bir ra'i is the tafsir that's not relying on transmission but it's relying on the sciences of Arabic. This is the tafsir that relies on Arabic grammar, the tafsir that relies on uh, rhetoric, balagha, that relies on uh, the, the ma'qulat, the, the rational sciences. And those sciences are used uh, as a way of interpreting the meanings of the verses. And this is found in tafasir that explore the linguistic aspects of the Qur'an. Uh, Imam al-Zamakhshari's tafsir is a good example, probably the most famous example of tafsir relying on the Arabic language, and there are many others. Um, but you find that the majority of the classical and well-respected tafasir are really a combination of tafsir bil ma'thur and tafsir bil ra'i. So you name any famous tafsir, and usually it's a combination of the two. Whether that is the tafsir of Imam al-Qurtubi, whether it is the tafsir of Imam al-Razi, the tafsir of al-Imam al-Alusi, Ruh al-Ma'ani. These are combinations of ma'thur and ra'i. They take their mastery of all of the ulum and apply them to tafsir. So there's ilm, the the knowledge of hadith and transmission and the knowledge of Arabic and theology and fiqh and usul and rhetoric and so on and all of that shows in their tafsir this is the second category you could add a third category and say there's ideological tafsir that's a later phenomena where the mufassir may or may not be qualified to give tafsir but their tafsir is uh, really informed by their particular political party or their particular ideology and you know for better or for worse there's a lot of good in some of those tafasir and there's a lot of things that are not so good in those tafasir um, examples of those would include uh, probably the most famous example is fi dhilal al-quran of sayyid qutb also the tafsir of maulana uh, maulana al-maududi his tafsir is like this as well um, but we come to the fourth one, which is the one I wanted to focus on. And we're going to revisit this as we go through each section. It's a form of tafsir called tafsir ishari. Tafsir ishari. Tafsir ishari uh, would be translated as a spiritually elusive tafsir. Elusive meaning... Uh, Illusion, not illusion, illusion, ishara. And ishara is pointing to something. When I point my finger, I'm making an ishara. I'm pointing at something. The tafsir ishari is really what we will call a spiritual form of tafsir. And when we say spiritual form of tafsir, it should not be confused with a uh, Baltini esoteric tafsir where the meanings are all made into symbols and metaphors that's not what a tafsir ishari is a tafsir ishari is really something of a misnomer because it's not really a tafsir in the traditional sense but it is drawing certain isharat indications and certain spiritual meanings from verses of the Quran is drawing some inspiration and some indications from the verses of Quran it doesn't deny the meaning of the verses the outward and standard meaning of the verses there's no denial of that like the botanies would it's affirming those meanings but it's understanding that from that one may derive some other spiritual meaning from it. So we want to we wanna really contrast these two forms, the Baltini esoteric f 
false tafsir versus the tafsir ishari, which is accepted with certain conditions. The Baltini esoteric tafsir, which is false, is the tafsir that says the outward meaning is not even what is intended. That's not what is meant by those verses. It's ghair murad. What is really meant is X, Y, Z. You know, taking that example, the Baltini tafsir would say, when Musa alayhi salam is told to cast your staff down, to throw it down, it's not, it, it's not really talking about a staff. It's talking about cast down your desires. So the staff, there was no real staff. It's just, this is a symbolic story completely, 100%. That's batil, that's false. Because we affirm it was an actual staff. And he was told by Allah Ta'ala to throw the staff. And it did in fact turn into an actual serpent. So that's a false form of tafsir. The tafsir ishari is a little different. It's affirming the outward meaning as it is. While understanding that there are certain indications that it gives. That the reader can appreciate spiritually speaking. So for this to happen, the tafsir ishari cannot negate the outward apparent meaning. No one can claim that the spiritual meaning is the only meaning of the verse. It can't be far-fetched. It has to be approximate. And it can't go against the sharia in any way or any other principle. And it has to be something that's already acknowledged in the tradition. It has to be something that's already a principle of our faith. So when we take all of those principles together, all of those conditions rather, and we apply it to the Qur'an, we see that each passage has in it certain indications. That being said, what indication is found in this part of the story, spiritually, for us? We look at the tafsir ishari literature, there's a few famous works of Tafsir Ishari, one by Imam Abu Qasim Al Qushayri, one by Abdul Rahman Al Sulami, and probably the most famous one, uh, a latter Tafsir known as Al Bahr Al Madid of Imam Ahmed Ibn Ajiba Al Hassani, as a famous North African Sheikh from Morocco. Imam Ibn Ajiba, who I'm a I'm a great fan of, uh, he wrote Al-Bahr al-Madid as a complete tafsir ishari. What he does, he, he gives the standard tafsir of the verses, relying mostly on Ibn Atiyah's Al-Muharral al-Wajiz, his tafsir. And then after the end of each section, he gives the ishara. What is the spiritual indication that we can draw from that part of the Qur'an or that part of the story in the Qur'an? What does he say about this section? After mentioning the dream and the conversation between Yaqub and Yusuf, he looks at this part and says, the ishara is that the illuminated beginnings point to illuminated endings. Man ashraqat bidayatuhu ashraqat nihayatuhu. And he's, he's drawing from an earlier work that uses that phrase. That... Yusuf السلام, saw the luminous, bright ending he would have very early on in his life. He saw that there are 11 stars and the sun and the moon and they were all prostrating before him. Imam Ibn Ajiba says, likewise, anyone who has uh, inaya, divine care, will see signs of that in the beginning, even if those things manifest only later on in their life. And he says that the good qualities that one will have at the end will be the opposite of the qualities they have in the beginning. I'll repeat that. He says that the opposite qualities, the, the good qualities that the person will have at the end are the opposite of the qualities they have in the beginning. He says, for example, 
perfect and complete honor in the end only comes through having humility in the beginning. If you want honor, is it only comes through tawadr, humility. Through the door of humility, you have is, you have honor. So your beginning has to be with humility if you're going to have honor later on. He says, Yusuf alayhi salam didn't attain dominion in the land, mulk. He didn't obtain izza, honor, until he actualized humility. He says that his richness, his material wealth, at the end, only came after he experienced need, faqr. He says his knowledge that he gained towards the end only came because it was preceded by having a lack of knowledge and then growing in that knowledge. And his strength at the end only came after having the state of weakness. He's cast in a well. He was in need. He was taken. So all of these qualities he had in the beginning are the very opposite of the qualities he had at the end. Poverty, need, brokenness. All of those were replaced by the opposite qualities. So he says, for us, it's the same. If you wish to have honor, you have to have humility. If you wish to have independence, to be free of need, you need to have your faqar, your poverty, in that state of poverty, unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says that ijtiba, for us, to have that chosenness, to be chosen by Allah with, with favors, ijtiba is only coming through ibtila, it only comes through test. The completion of ni'am, of blessings, is only through experiencing niqam, tribulations. It only comes through that. And that is what makes all of these things the more sweeter. As the Prophet ﷺ says, that Jannah has been surrounded by makari. Hufatin Jannah bil makari. Jannah has been surrounded by things that are disliked, things that are tough, things that are yeah, not so nice. Right? And Imam Ibn Ajiba, he says, this hadith applies both to the Jannah of Zakharif, the Jannah of the garden, the actual garden itself, as well as the Jannah of Ma'arif, of closeness to Allah and divine knowledge. It's also going to be surrounded by difficulties, tribulations, and trials, ups and downs. So the lesson we get from this is Yusuf alayhi salam, in the very beginning, this is before he starts to experience all of these things, in the very beginning, he has the vision of the end. But before he gets to that end, he goes through all of these things. But there's in the beginning the signs of the illuminated end. You just have to know what they are. And this is Ibn, Ibn Ajiba's ishara, his spiritual indication from this part of the story. As you see, it's not negating the actual facts of the story. It's affirming the outward meaning of the story. It's just drawing a lesson a broader lesson from the story, a lesson that is already substantiated within the tradition. And that is that to have those things, you get them through their opposites. And the one who has an illuminated beginning is the one, the one who has the illuminated ending has the illuminated beginning because you have to start from some beginning. And that beginning is through wakefulness, and tawbah and journeying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you experience different tri tribulations and trials along the way but ultimately it is illumination ultimately it is forgiveness ultimately it is a sweet experience after going through all of those things that's the ishara that he derives from the verse walhamdulillahi uh, rabbil alameen so next um, next week inshallah we go into the plot we go into what the brothers of Yusuf do and how they do it, how they try to cover it up, and all of these things. We move along into the story, insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, starting with the verse, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفُ وَإِخْوَتِهِ 
ayatun lisa'idin. Certainly with Yusuf and his brothers are many signs for those who ask. So we'll look at that verse and then we'll go into the plot as well and how it's carried out. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَاللَّهُ رَسُولُ أَعْلَمُ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ عَلَى سَيِّدْنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَسَلَّمْ Any questions? Inshallah, we can take a couple. Naam. It's a good question. <laughs> and secondly, we know uh, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam received his first revelation, mm -hmm. then that was the official start, mm -hmm. if I may put it that way. How did the prophets know that they were? I thought they were chosen uh, to be, the, and they were born prophets. But at some point, they realized that they were mm. they had a task. They had a, yeah, so that's, a, that's about four or five questions right there. <laughs> so I'm going to try to answer one or two, and I'll have to leave some of the others for later. Okay. Um, so the first question, what is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Uh, it's interesting you ask that now, <laughs> because in our Aqidah class, we've been spending the last two weeks just looking at that question. Um, the quick and easy answer is that every messenger is a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger. The essential difference between the prophet and the messenger is that a messenger is given a, either a scripture, a book, or they are given a sharia, a law, that has abrogated the sharia of the, the previous prophet, messenger. Or they receive a scripture and a sharia that's abrogating a sharia from a prophet prior. While a prophet, according to this distinction, will convey a message from a scripture given to a prophet before him and uphold the sharia of the sharia of the prophet before him the prophet is not bringing a new sharia and this is the basic difference right so on that basis and, and there's differences of opinion about the exact nature but on that basis Musa alayhi salam was when Allah ta'ala uh, revealed to him at the burning bush that was Nubuwa. But when Allah Ta'ala told him, Idhaba ila Fir'auna innahu tagha, go to Fir'aun, he's now being tasked with conveying that, and that is Risala. So there's also the issue of conveyance that comes into play. Um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he receives Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, that's Nubuwa. And there was a period of time when he was not told to convey. There was a specific time when he was given the command to convey. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anthir. That moment he's told to arise and warn, that's the risala. As far as the issue of uh, the nature of nubuwa and chosenness, uh, you bring up a really good point that's worthy of more exploration and discussion. When we say that a, a prophet is made a prophet, we mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to, re to reveal the wahi upon that prophet at a specific time of his choosing. Even though that person has been chosen for nubuwa in Allah ta'ala's knowledge since pre-eternity, beginningless eternity. That's Allah Ta'ala's foreknowledge. And the prophets are a community unto themselves, even in the Alam al-Arwah, because they all testified, independent of other people, that if they are to alive, when the final prophet comes, they will acknowledge him and support him. This indicates that there is, there's something beyond uh, there's something uh, unique to that station that even applies to them before they were born. So it's not that they were some blank slate. 
and they grew up and all of a sudden <laughs> they just became prophets like that. Allah chose to reveal at certain times, but they were chosen obviously in pre-eternity, right? And we see that in some of the hadith as well. As some of the companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah, mata kunta nabiyan? When were you a prophet? And the Prophet والسلام, said, uh, I was a prophet uh, when Adam was between water and clay. Now, what does that mean? Because Adam was the first human being. How can he be a prophet when Adam was between water and clay? It's a little complex. We talked about it in the Lives of Man class. And we mentioned that the ruh of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, was created before the ruh of Sayyidina Adam. And in this sense, he is the first prophet. But Adam السلام, is the first human being that uh, his physical form was before the physical form of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم. So Adam was the first prophet ظهوراً, and in appearance, but in, t- in the world of souls, the first soul created was the soul of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and, in, and that's what it means when he says that I was a prophet when Adam was between water and clay. So we don't say that um, the Prophet وسلم, was a prophet in the sense of receiving revelation during his childhood. But at the same time, we know that he is nurtured in the, for the maqam of Nubuwa and is always being increased and is protected. And, to, and he receives the wahi when he's 40 years old and was a Nabi by that designation and after some time was designated as a Rasul. So every messenger is a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger. So, easier question. Uh, easier question? What was the name of the third part of Tafsir? You said Ma'thur, Ra'i, and then Shari. Uh, so Tafsir bil Ma'thur, Tafsir bil Ra'i, uh, the third, I, I don't know what you'd... Uh, tafsir ideology. <laughs> tafsir Fikri, yeah. yeah. And Tafsir, uh, and, uh, Kelbi, uh, which one of them? Uh, Ibn Juzay. Uh, that would be like most tafasir. It's a combination. It's a combination. Yeah. Yes. If you can answer now, it's okay. Otherwise, inshallah, in the next class. My question is, Lanat Allah, Lanat of Allah Ta'ala means the away from the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So in the Quran, if there is a mentioning of that Dawood Alayhi Salaam and Isa Alayhi Salaam did this Lanat to the, their nation, which is Bani Israel. Mm-hmm. I'd like to hear something <laughs> if you explain about that. Uh, why they do, I think one reason come to my mind, they were giving so much uh, problems to the prophets and that's the reason or uh, is this if, uh, the reason I want to, some more like I like to hear. Mm-hmm. One is, is it one is that the nation was giving a lot of trouble to the prophets, they used to kill even messenger in the, who comes in their mm-hmm. nation. Yeah, the la'na, the, the curse means to be made distant and remote from Allah Ta'ala. And the curse applies to those who take on those qualities. Not every single individual who may or may not have those, those qualities. If someone doesn't have the qualities, then they're not subject to the la'na. So those who fit those, that description would be receiving the la'na uttered upon the tongue of Dawood. And this... Aywa, there you go. It mentions the qaid of kufr, of kufr, that those who disbelieve among them, yeah. So it basically kufr, but also kufr combined with other qualities of uh, obstinance, juhud, uh, mukabara, arrogance and pride, uh, plotting and conniving, and really <laughs> what we call playing games with the deen, playing games with the deen of Allah Ta'ala and, and using the, the aql as a way to bypass the, the, the law, using the aql as a way to bypass the law. And, and this was a common thread in, in those narratives. Wa iyaakum. Khair. Subhanakallahumma wa alhamdulillah. Shawwal la ilaha illa anta. Wa atubu ilaikum. Wa akhud da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alameen. So.